Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions that Middle Eastern archaeologists make to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University, and I'm joined by Dr. Kent Bramlett, an associate professor of archaeology and of the history of antiquity, and chair of the Biblical Studies and Archaeology Department, or Department of Biblical Studies and Archaeology. So that's right, that. yeah. That's right. So, uh, Dr. Larry Garrity, my co-host, is, I'm going to say, on assignment. He is uh, in Europe uh, uh, presently. Uh, he'll be back uh, for, I think, a few editions down the road, a few episodes down the road. Kent, we are privileged to continue our walk through the Bible with archaeological insights. And at this point, we have kind of shifted toward the 6th century BC. We do have, um, we actually have spent some time in the 6th century with prophets like Jeremiah, uh, but now we are moving into the 6th century, the time of a major event in ancient history, in Judah's history. Right. What's that major event? Well, it is the exile. Jerusalem is finally conquered. There had been threats earlier, but Jerusalem had always survived. So it's a huge shock to the people of Judah that the, their country is, has now fallen and, and the capital has been conquered. Um, this is a well-documented time in history. We know quite a bit about the sixth century. And so it's interesting to explore the historical and archeological backgrounds uh, to this tremendously important or theologically important event. And as you say, it's easier to do with this event than with some we've dealt with in the past, given the historical sources, given the archeological record that we have. A number of scholars have taken the Babylonian exile as the end of um, kind of bookending the end of a long period of time, which many of them would begin with the Exodus. So the mm. Exodus kind of defines um, ancient Israel, its theology, its covenant with God, its relationship with God, the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial system, and so on. And the exile kind of brings all of that to an end. There's maybe a temptation on our part because we're so far removed, to think of the exile, to read about the exile, and then just kind of move on. But it's more significant than that, isn't it? It is. It's a huge, well, it's a transformative event in biblical history. When Judah reconstitutes itself after the exile, they're not the same anymore. Um, from this point on, we call the people Jews, right. and the identity has shifted. And uh, while there's a continuity, there's also a discontinuity. And it's interesting to explore what the exile has done to the theology and the outlook of the people. And it's been significant. It's been hugely significant. Let's talk about some artifacts, and then we want to turn to this time period. And we want, before we even move to the book of Ezekiel, which is the major book from the time of the exile, we want to think about the, the whole sixth century. And right. to do that, we'll look at some artifacts. I think you have some in front of you. So begin with, your, with the large vessel on your left there, and then let's move across the table. Well, large vessels are important at all times. I mean, they, they use the ceramic vessels to store liquids and, and dry goods. Probably one like this would be for liquids, maybe olive oil. And you can imagine then that uh, they would have to dip out smaller amounts. And, but it would, it would be a very functional vessel for a typical household at this time. Right. And we'll come to some more household items in a minute. But we're bookended now by household items there and here. But yeah. what do we have in the center, the focus on writing? Well, we have a great... Um, example of different types of, of documents from this time period. Uh, one of my favorites is this <laughs> authentic brick of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it, it has an inscription. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar had, I was going to say thousands, it had millions of the <laughs> bricks that were in his construction project stamped with uh, variations of, of, a, of an inscription. This one, uh, we'll, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's, it's amazing to actually work with my students in Akkadian class and then to finish the, 
the study, the quarter out with the translation project, um, reading Nebuchadnezzar's inscription. Uh, that's amazing. There are lots of them around, although I imagine they're disappearing, certainly uh, in situ, in the original setting, right. um, because of all of the uh, political and militaristic sorts of activities. Right. A lot of destruction has taken place. And this one came out decades ago. It did. And no longer... Um, the well, certainly not under the, the, the major antiquities laws. Right. Uh, which I think, what, 1978, at least mm -hmm. in the country of Jordan where we work. Uh, right. That seems to be important. In any case, yeah, this has come to us legitimately. Mm -hmm. We take that seriously because we do. we do not want to contribute in any way to continued looting. Mm -hmm. So we the don't... Massive sell. destruction that's going that's on. That's right. And we will simply not be a part of uh, encouraging that type of activity. So we have this one, and it was part of our collection and donated to us. Mm -hmm. So other kinds of writing material that we have here. Well, we have, um, broadly speaking, cuneiform inscriptions. So those are the wedge-shaped writings on clay, like clay tablets, and also ink uh, inscript or writing on pot shirts. We call these ostraca. An ostracon is simply a convenient um, piece of pot shirt, broken pottery that was lying around, and they could scratch out a, or sketch out a, a draft, or sometimes they used it as the actual... Um, medium for communication. Challenging to find a, a broken piece of pottery to write a note on? Well, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Short answer, no. Short answer is no. Um, these things were just broken pots. We were just tossed out the door and uh, I, find I'm, them everywhere. I've been trying to calculate how many broken pieces of pottery we have processed at our excavations mm -hmm. at Tel El Ameri in Jordan, beginning in 1984 and up even through this last summer in uh, 2016, and it has to be millions. And we uh, wash each one. And we wash each one, and then we throw most of them back, back yes. uh, into these piles. Mm -hmm. But these were everywhere. People could have picked them up, mm -hmm. and if you're literate, or if you were trying to teach somebody to write, these would make great tablets uh, to write something on. And mm -hmm. we will come to, in, in this episode, to some ostraca that played a significant role in the fall of Jerusalem. And gives us unique insights into those final Tremendous days. Tremendous insights. Okay, a couple of other things here. Well, we have a replica. I might point out this is the only artifact on the table that's a replica of the famous Cyrus Cylinder. We'll be coming back to this. It was one, this is a copy of one of several that were sent throughout the, the Persian kingdom. And, um, and probably what? Uh, maybe two-thirds the size of the original? The, would you say sure, the something like that. original would have been, right, um, right. was larger. It's a great inscription, too. We'll come back to it, as you said. Yeah. And then we have uh, typical cuneiform documents, um, mostly economic texts. It would record receipts, okay. be like receipts, of what was brought to the temple. Okay. So we move then back to domestic and lamps. We have three of them um, from this century. So what, moving mm -hmm. from this side, uh, the older one, uh, right. moving to the right, and something that actually could go into the Hellenistic Early into Hellenistic, the Greek early, period. early part. So we could talk You can about see that. they're closing it. And by the time then in the later Hellenistic, they make them in molds of two parts, and they actually are covered right. over on top. Right. And when we're talking about this time period, we're talking about a couple of major empires, Babylonian and Persian, Persian and then we'll move to Greek mm -hmm. uh, in the next centuries. And then a couple of other small vessels, what, vessels for liquids, I'm assuming? Uh, pouring, This, one, this sure. one's certainly these for pouring. These two jugs. for pouring. Uh, and a little juglet here as well. That's probably a dipper juglet, so that would be used for pouring, mm -hmm. dipping out and pouring. Okay. And this juglet is more for fine products. Mm -hmm unguents, perfumes, special oils. Kind of thing. And this one too, I'm assuming, because yeah. it has a very small opening and right. we can assume that was for some sort of precious liquid yeah. of some kind. Okay, we will have occasion as we continue this episode to keep these things in mind because especially of the text that we'll be looking at uh, as we turn our attention to the entire period, this sixth century of Babylonian and Persian control and what that means for Judah and the people of God as we think about it in the Old Testament. Kent, we are going to have some maps. I like um, maps. And I know you like maps. I'm okay with that. And we're going to look at Judah, Babylon, and 
Persia. So if you wouldn't mind a little bit about this. Again, we are, actually we've seen this map before, those who've seen earlier episodes, but now we're thinking about the whole time frame of a century and we want to hold them together. Well, here we have Judah, the core area of of um, what's left of the Israelite identity. I mean, all the other areas have been in exile for, uh, well, a cent more than a century. And so all of the activity that we, we encounter in the land occurs in this small area around Jerusalem, a little bit to the south, um, just a, a, f a handful of miles. You know, it's only maybe 50 miles um, in length at this point. It's important, though, because we need to put it into the context of the larger political scene. The Babylonians have conquered in this century. They come in in several sweeps coming through. And then in, uh, what is it, um, uh, 582, I think, they do take out the Transjordanian uh, kingdoms of Ammon, of Ammon and Moab. So they last a little bit longer, but eventually they, they fall as well. And so this whole area then becomes um, part of the larger Babylonian and then Persian empire. Okay, let's look at the empire maps now. Right. First of all, the Babylonian. Okay, so this puts it in context. And we've already talked about in the earlier history uh, sessions with kings and um, the fall of the Assyrians as the Babylonians in southern Mesopotamia, close to the Persian Gulf here, this is the Babylonian core area, they push up taking out, conquering the Assyrians, and then angle south, following the Fertile Crescent along the Mediterranean coast, knocking out smaller kingdoms as they come, uh, threatening then Judah eventually, and, and even invading Egypt mm -hmm. for a time. Okay, okay the uh, Persian Empire. The Persians, actually the Persians are a little bit late on the scene. This, in, in ancient times, this was Elamite territory. But the Persians were a nomadic people that spoke a Indo-European language, and they migrated down and with the Medes um, became the significant political power in this region and eventually push west, taking out the Babylonians then and then pushing up through it's old Assyrian territory and on down to the Fertile Crescent. This is a pattern that's repeated time and time again. But you notice that the empire is bigger than any of the preceding empires. Now, this is all coming with the Babylonians and the Persians from the east, but when they arrive in Jerusalem, for instance, they're coming from, from the, the north. north. Exactly. That's important for lots of reasons, and when we read in this material about the dangers from the north, this does not take a lot of imagination for people who lived in Jerusalem to, right. uh, to, to realize where their, where their danger was coming from. Right, geopolitically they're coming down, and even the city of Jerusalem is usually breached from the northern side. Right, so. right, right, right. Okay, now, Kent, we're going to think about some content stuff. So we're going to leave these slides on the screen because there's a lot here. And um, we'll actually have occasion to look at them again when we look at Ezekiel. But for the century, we want to have some kings and some prophets in mind. Who are these kings? And just a quick note about each one as we go through the century. Well, these are all descendants of, of Josiah, um, sons and uh, a grandson or two. So in the dynasty of David. In the dynasty of David. But you can just see how unstable the kingship is at this time by looking at the lengths of their reigns, and for various reasons. The uh, Babylonians depose one. Um, there are various issues. Some rebel against um, the imperial powers that are, are deposed. So Jehoiakim is a, actually one of the more important ones because he managed to reign for um, well over 10 years, or about 10 years. Um, whereas uh, some of the other, you do have Jehoiachin listed, but he only reigns um, it's a few well, months. A few months, right. yeah, three months, I think right. it is. Right. And Zedekiah uh, then is another one who reigns a little bit longer, close to 10 years. And um, if we want to include Gedaliah, he's just a governor, um, but he and also- that's after the destruction of Jerusalem. Right, right, and that represents some instability as well, politically. Right. We'll see. And then Sheshbazar or Shesh, how well, you, you can it? anglicize it as Shesh Bazar or okay. Hebrew, uh, and Zerubbabel. It. So, I've got question marks there. Um, it's hard to know where to place them, but they're toward the end of the century. They are, and Shesh um, Bazar or Shesh Bazar doesn't seem to be on the scene for very long. 
He's mentioned it in the, one of the returns and then disappears. I from can history. almost imagine that there was a lot of expe expectation placed on these two leaders. There must have that been. They, they, somebody has to carry on the lineage of David. And they're, they're, these stakes are high, yeah. but they don't last. Yeah. They just fizzle. They seem to fizzle. And we don't hear much about the, no. the, the disappointment or at the no. end. They just fade from the, from the text. They do. And then the prophets we have, um, Jeremiah, right at the, toward the end of Jeremiah. Uh, maybe we could talk about the last half of Jeremiah. All of Ezekiel. Obadiah, it's hard to know where to place, but it seems pretty clear, I think, to most scholars that uh, he is exilic from the time of the exile. Um, most people feel that these chapters from Isaiah belong to the 6th century, and we'll have occasion, we'll have a, um, an episode on each of them. Right, we'll begin And look those. at them more closely, as well as Haggai and Zechariah, who were together. Then we've got some other kings. Who are these leaders? Well, these are certainly important players in the political scene. Um, the kings of Babylon, those are just about all of the kings, ex uh, not quite, but the significant ones of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. We think of that head of gold of Daniel's, uh, right. The, right. you know, the vision um, in the book of Daniel. But really, it's a very short-lived dynasty, maybe uh, 70 years. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, his father was a founder. He's, of course, the most famous. And then it ends with um, Nabonidus. Uh, just a few decades later. Yeah. And then some Persian kings. Right. Uh, Cyrus, we will come to his inscription shortly. And Cambyses, and I say Darius, but I maybe it's too. Darius. Well, uh, I'm not the, sure. The British pronunciation, I think, is Darius. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, And again, we left the prophets here, but we have to think about all of these, um, these individuals because they're all players. It's a, it's a moving, active game, and there are lots of players, and they're changing often, and they're part of what makes, it seems to me, the Babylonian exile so traumatic. You just can't count on anything lasting. Um, rulers are changing, that means yep. this, the... Even the empires are changing. That's right, and the regime changes, and there are different laws, all kinds of things, just to keep things unstable, I think, in, in, in some ways. And then another slide here with some basic events from the 6th century. And we won't say any, a whole lot about each one of these, but the major deportations from Judah in 605, 597, and in 587 or 6. Gedaliah, we don't think, lasted long. Um, and then in 562, 61, we'll look at a text about this where Jehoiakim in Babylonian captivity is given a new status, a raised status. This probably uh, fostered some, some, well, some enthusiasm, maybe some raised hopes among the Certainly exiles. Certainly so. In fact, it, it seems to me that a lot of people would have put their hopes in Jehoiakim, not in Zedekiah. Zedekiah was really wishy-washy, and I think theologically, a lot of people put their hopes in Jehoiakim. And to see him now come out of the prison and being now given a, a different sort of status would have raised some hopes significantly. And then we've got a couple things here from Persia and, uh, and Cyrus and so on. And the, the second temple foundation, what, from the work of Haggai and Zechariah? Primarily? Right, we get insight into that. Um, again, part of the reconstruction, reconstituting who the people are, their identity, right. establishing the temple. And if we want to think about the biblical literature from this time period, part of this is, uh, is debated, but I think at least primarily most scholars would agree with the, the list that we have here. The prophets that we've uh, already talked about, at least the final editing of Kings and Chronicles, and both Second Kings and Second Chronicles relate events at the end of their of the books dealing with this period. So we know right, that they had right. to be around and cover them. Several people point to a number of psalms that come from this time period. Um, I think it is 137 where you are the the captives are are commanded to sing a song of Zion and they can't. Right. They're in captivity and they can't bring themselves to do it. It's too so painful. 
yeah, it's, it's, the, it's too deeply affecting them. And so we think that that's the case. And then a number of scholars would say that the biblical books, were, which were held sacred and inspired in order to mean something to communities that kept changing, especially the trauma of the exile, that uh, editors would, uh, in, in the spirit of the particular book, would add something that would give courage and hope. That's typically how it happens from the time of the exile. So we pay attention to this. We think of this all as inspired, but we do. But we see, we see some fingerprints, some human fingerprints at work, in 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 transferring these books to us. And and right. in the process, the Babylonian exile exerts a huge influence. It truly really does. It's transformative. It is. So I, was, I was coming back to your word transformative, transformative. from a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's transformative even in the biblical books. It's giving them a new life. Uh, just it's adding. an interesting way to think about it because yeah. we often think about the transformation in the, in the people, but the books and the way they're meaningful to an audience uh, is, is also partly in the interpretation and make and how they are relevant to changing conditions right 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 okay a list of dilemmas of the exile well i have to say <laughs> something about this list i remember this list <laughs> one of the earliest things i remember uh from you um 27 years ago oh, i just i just added up the years <laughs> 1989 and you had a, a seminar for the community uh, in Walla Walla, mm -hmm. and um, I think I was the only student there, <laughs> if I recall. <laughs> but I was, I was utterly fascinated by your list of dilemmas, and I've never forgotten. Um, I had never thought about the huge impact in all of these dimensions that the loss of the land, the temple, uh, would have effected in, in the people as they go into exile. Right. I do feel that it is this sense of loss that really helps us understand the biblical writers from the time period and the theological chasm, the, the abyss into which uh, Judah had fallen because of the captivity. And if you just look at this list, loss of, uh, losses, of course, due to, welfare, to warfare, but the temple, the priesthood, that means forgiveness, that, and, and also the Davidic uh, line of kings, the covenant, God makes a covenant, it's over. Uh, the loss of land, um, turning over land to foreigners, which means the end, the absolute end of sensible theology. Right. This, these were central to the promises that they had been living under for hundreds of years, and now it's over. Right. The land is gone. Right. Now, one of the things that took me into Ezekiel for my uh, dissertation, my PhD dissertation, is this list, which creates this tremendous sense of loss. I wanted to see how the prophets from the time dealt with these losses. Uh -huh. And when we get to Ezekiel in our program, we'll see what Ezekiel does, because he actually treats all of them. That's so that's we'll, interesting. We'll, we'll take a look at that. And, and I think we have to have this list in front of us whenever we're dealing with biblical literature from this time period, because it captures that, that void, that huge theological void. Everything is turned on its head. Right. These are the issues that the messages are addressing. Right. Right. So we have some inscriptions and some archaeological uh, evidence. We'll actually look at some of the inscriptions, as many as we have time for on this episode. The archaeological evidence, a number of things. W what on this list uh, catches your attention on, on the uh, archaeological well, evidence? Well, the, the numbers, it is interesting. We often debate how depopulated was the land. And um, the, sort of the traditional view uh, had been that it was left empty and the wild animals roamed around. Not completely empty, but largely right. so. But more recent scholarship has, has I think, realized, uh, and rightly so, that um, it, it wasn't depopulated, that there were a significant uh, number left behind, actually a majority. Yeah, that's right. Some people would say maybe only 10% were taken, oh. although we have a larger decrease in population through that time that's period, right. That's right. which is, is due to various uh, factors. Right. Right. I, I agree. I think the numbers, the population numbers, are extremely interesting in what we're dealing with here. And I might add that the destructions are more in the region of Judah 
Benjamin, the sites in Benjamin, you have a, a, a line there that mentions undisturbed sites. And many of the sites in Benjamin continue, but it's a very small area. Right, right. Well, then, let's look at some of these inscriptions. This from the very beginning of the century, 597, 598, something like that. So it's right at the beginning. And it has to do with um, the, what, the Babylonian uh, onslaught to Jerusalem at that time period? It does. So it covers what, Kent? Shall I read it? Yeah, let's read it. In the seventh year, that would be 598, 597, the month of Kislimu, the king of Akkad, that's the ceremonial name for the king of Babylon, mustered his troops, marched to the Hatilan, and besieged the city of Judah. And on the second day of the month of Adaru, he seized the city and captured the king. He appointed there a king of his own choice, received its heavy tribute, and sent to Babylon. And that is the king who becomes Zedekiah, uh, that is King Zedekiah, who then uh, reigns for another 10 years until the next Babylonian assault. So we do have some connections there. We won't take the time to read the text, um, but the letters right. here. And they're so important. These, are, these were found in the gate, the dis destroyed gate of Lachish, and relay communication between the commander at Lachish, which is really the second city of the kingdom right. after Jerusalem, up to his, his communication with um, the officials in Jerusalem. Right. And it's probably days before the it, city falls. It seems like it. And again, we won't take time to read the whole thing this time. But right there at the end, what? Even after the other remaining signal fires have gone out, we're, we're still We're hoping. still standing. But we are still standing. Uh, another one is the um, Ba'alei Seal from uh, our site, which uh, is, is certainly dealing with an Ammonite king. And uh, it is. we've looked at this before, and we'll at least mention at this point that this is an Ammonite king who shows up in the book of Jeremiah. And it's an extremely important find. He, it is, and he sponsors a successful assassination attempt against Gedaliah, this governor we just Which accounts about. for Jeremiah ending That's up in right. Egypt. So That's it has right. huge historical it does. consequences. It does. Another mud brick, we've already talked about that, but this is the basic translation. What it is. is. Nebuchadnezzar, second line, king of Babylon. I would prefer to say the, um, well, the rebuilder, the restorer. Um, in a sense, a guardian, that's what guardians do, of the temples of Esagila and Ezida is the noble son. So he's not just a son or even the first son, but the legitimate noble son of Nebuchadnezzar, king of, of Babylon. Right. Uh, this is that text about Jehoiakim. Um, I want to end, though, with this one, and this is the Cyrus inscription, the Cyrus cylinder. Basically, just briefly, what does it cover? Well, it relays the, um, the really the, the um, victory of Cyrus over the Babylonians and then the political policy of the Persians to restore and rebuild the, um, uh, the, the temples and the uh, lands that they, they had been But some great texts about Cyrus, by Cyrus, happy to talk about himself. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you, Kent, and thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope this has added to your uh, learning and to your faith development, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.